Hi class and welcome to chapter 15, which is on the respiratory system, um, which really talks about breathing and gas exchange. So respiration includes the following processes, uh, ventilation or breathing, which is the movement of air into and out of the lungs, and as well as the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide between the air in the lungs and the blood, uh, the transport of oxygen and carbon dioxide in the blood, as well as the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide between the blood and the tissues. The functions of your respiratory system um, are the respiration, the inhale and exhale, uh, regulation of blood pH, voice production, olfaction, which is smelling, as well as innate immunity. So we divide the respiratory <clears throat> tract in the upper, into the upper respiratory tract and the lower respiratory tract. And the upper respiratory tract consists of the external nose, the nasal cavity, and the pharynx. And that is what's shown here. Your nasal cavity will be where inhaled air should go through uh, for proper conditioning, and we'll talk about what that means. The pharynx is just another word for the throat, and then the larynx is another word for your voice box. Then the lower respiratory tract is made up of your trachea or windpipe, and then the bronchi, where the windpipe splits, and then the associated lungs that the bronchi will continue to branch into. So your external nose is mainly hyaline cartilage. The nasal cavity extends from your uh, nostrils to the cone, coane in the back. Uh, the coana or the coain are openings to the pharynx and the hard palate is its roof. You have the paranasal sinuses are air filled spaces within the bone. They will open into the nasal cavity and be lined with mucus. Uh, the conche or conche are on each side of the nasal cavity and they will increase the surface area of the nasal cavity. They will help um, to clean the air, humidify and warm the air. Um, for your lungs. The nasal lacrimal ducts will carry tears from the eyes and they will open into the nasal cavity. Um, so if you are crying, there's more tear secretion and that's why you need a tissue um, because those tears are draining into the nasal cavity. Uh, your nose helps in filtering the air. It's the airway for respiration. Your nose is involved in speech. There are olfactory receptors in the nose to help with smelling. Uh, the nose helps to warm the air, as well as um, the idea of sneezing will help dislodge any materials from the nose that could be blocking the passageway for air. Uh, the pharynx is another way for your throat, word for your throat. It's a common passageway for your respiratory and digestive systems. The nasopharynx will take in the air behind the nasal cavity. The oropharynx is behind the oral cavity and it extends from the uvula the little teardrop structure at the back of the throat to your epiglottis. The oropharynx will take in food, drink, and air. And then the laryngopharynx is behind the larynx and it will extend from your epiglottis to your esophagus. And this is where food and drink will pass through. Uh, the uvula is the little grape or teardrop. It's an extension of the soft palate in the back of the oropharynx. The pharyngeal tonsil will aid in defending against infections. So here's a little anatomy of the nasal cavity in the pharynx. You can see here the nasal nasopharynx, um, the soft palate with the uvula hanging down. Um, here's the oropharynx and then the laryngopharynx is behind the larynx. Uh, this little flap here is called the epiglottis and the epiglottis will close and shut over the opening to your larynx uh, when you swallow food. So that food will go uh, toward and down the posterior esophagus instead of down your trachea. So your epiglottis is a really important mechanism um, for shutting quickly so that food goes down the esophagus and not your trachea. If a little food or water um, gets past the epiglottis before it shuts, we say uh, it went down the wrong pipe because that little food or water um, went just kind of into the larynx region and you'll cough it out usually. Uh, the lower respiratory tract consists of the lower larynx portions, the trachea, the bronchi, and the lungs. And you can see they are shown here, like in that first picture we went over. The larynx is located in the anterior throat and extends from the base of the tongue to the trachea. It consists of cartilages. The thyroid cartilage is the largest. Also, it is called the Adam's apple. The epiglottis is a piece of cartilage that flaps over, 
um, when swallowing occurs to prevent anything swallowed to get into the larynx. The vocal folds or cords are the source of your voice production. <clears throat> Air will move past them and they will vibrate and the sound will be produced. The force of the air determines loudness and the tension determines the pitch. During puberty, testosterone um, will cause male vocal cords to increase in length, which will lower uh, male voice. Laryngitis, another itis word meaning an inflammation. So laryngitis is an inflammation of your vocal folds, and this can be caused by overuse, dry air, or infection. So here's the anatomy of the larynx. You can see the thyroid cartilage here. <clears throat> the Adam's apple of the thyroid cartilage is this prominence that sticks out. And you'll notice that um, that Adam's apple is also more prominent in males. And that's because during puberty, again, testosterone works to increase uh, the thyroid cartilage as it's also increasing the length of those vocal cords. You can see here the epiglottis is this little flap, again, that will close off the opening to the larynx. Um, during swallowing of food and drink. So here's a look at the vestibular and vocal folds. So that your vestibular are kind of more lateral. These are the false vocal cords. The glottis is the opening and the vocal folds are the true vocal folds, folds um, that will open and close um, to allow sound to pass through. Your trachea is also called the windpipe. It consists of these C-shaped um, pieces of cartilage that keep it opening keep it open at all times. It contains uh, pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium and smoking will completely damage the cilia. Um, cilia is really important for moving the mucus that traps anything harmful you breathe in. So smoking will eventually kill off that cilia. Um, so whatever is trapped or particles of air that you breathe in <clears throat> that is harmful for the lungs, um, your lungs won't be able to uh, get those trapped particles back out. So you could develop a smoker's cough. Um, smokers generally tend to cough more because their cilia aren't working to move those um, trapped materials, so they have to cough to get them out. Um, <clears throat> the trachea will divide into the right and left primary bronchi, um, into the right and left lungs. The bronchi divide from the trachea. They will connect to the lungs. And they are also lined with cilia that will contain um, C-shaped pieces of cartilage, again, um, to keep the bronchi open at all times. The lungs then are the primary organ of respiration. And they are cone-shaped. The base of the lungs will rest on the diaphragm and the apex will extend above the clavicle. The right lung has three lobes and the left lung has two lobes and the lungs contain many air passageways or divisions. So here are the lung airway passages. The primary bronchi will branch into secondary bronchi, which will branch into tertiary bronchi, which will eventually branch into bronchioles and terminal bronchioles and respiratory bronchioles into alveolar ducts and alveoli. So basically we get this trachea and bronchi branching into a tree-shaped structure of air passageway. Um, the alveoli are kind of the final piece of the puzzle. These structures become smaller and more numerous from primary bronchi to alveoli. And alveoli is where the gas exchange will occur, meaning where oxygen will go from the air you breathe in into um, the blood capillaries and where carbon dioxide will go from the blood capillaries back into the air to be exhaled. So here's the anatomy of the trachea and the lungs. And you can see here how the primary bronchii will branch into secondary and eventually tertiary and bronchioles to terminal bronchioles. Um, and you can see here how the right lung has three lobes to it, but the left lung only has two. And that's because the left lung has this cardiac notch, the area more where the heart will sit. You can also see here how the lungs will sit on top of the diaphragm. So here's a look at the lungs, the lung lobes, and the bronchi, some anatomy. Um, the hilum is the word for the area where all the blood vessels and the bronchii will enter and exit the lung. Here's the right lung. You can see the three different lobes, superior, middle, and um, inferior lobe. Again, the left lung 
just has a superior and inferior lobe because it has what we call um, a cardiac impression and a cardiac notch, which gives space for the heart to sit. Alveoli then are small air sacs. This is where gas exchange occurs. They are surrounded by capillaries and there are 300 million alveoli in your lungs. Um, the alveoli are rounded air sacs and if we would stretch out the alveoli, their surface area would cover the size of a tennis court. So lots of surface area for this gas exchange to occur. Again, that means oxygen going into your blood capillaries and carbon dioxide going back out into the air you exhale. An asthma attack is the contraction of these terminal bronchioles, which will lead to reduced airflow into the alveoli. So here's a look at the bronchioles and alveoli. Um, the bronchioles will end in these alveolar sacs, and you can see here how they're covered in pulmonary capillaries where the gas exchange will occur. The respiratory membrane, so in your lungs where gas exchange um, occurs between air and blood, this is the respiratory membrane. It's formed by walls of the alveoli and capillaries. Alveolar ducts and respiratory bronchioles also will contribute and it is extremely thin so that gases can diffuse easily across it. Um, the layers of the respiratory membrane, there's a thin layer of fluid from the alveolus there's the alveolar simple squamous epithelium. There's the basement membrane of the alveolar epithelium. There's a very thin interstitial space. And then there's the basement membrane of the capillary endothelium, which will be a simple squamous. So here's just a look at the alveolus and the respiratory membrane. Um, I like to show this picture first. So this shows um, the alveolar fluid, the alveolar epithelium. Um, then the basement membrane of the alveolar epithelium, the interstitial space, and the basement membrane of the capillary. So we have a really thin kind of series of layers here just to allow um, really rapid and passive and easy gas exchange. So um, oxygen will diffuse um, from the air in the alveolus into the red blood cell to be carried in hemoglobin and carbon dioxide will diffuse out of the red blood cell into the air you breathe to be exhaled out of the lungs. Uh, pleural membranes and cavities. So the pleura is a double layered membrane around the lungs. The parietal pleura is a membrane that lines the thoracic cavity and the visceral pleura is a membrane that covers the lung surface. The pleural cavity is just the space around each lung. And here's a look at the pleural cavities and their membranes. Um, so if we look here, you can see kind of the visceral and parietal pericardium around the heart. And then you start to see the pleural cavity. The parietal pleura um, is on the um, body cavity wall and the visceral pleura is on the lungs themselves with a pleural cavity, um, the space between the two. And ventilation is just another word for breathing. And this is the process of moving air in and out of the lungs, it will use the diaphragm, which is a skeletal muscle that separates the thoracic and abdominal cavities. Inspiration is to breathe in, and this will use the diaphragm and the external intercostal muscles. Expiration is breathing out, which uses the diaphragm, and forceful expiration uses internal intercostal muscles. And intercostal muscles are muscles between um, ribs and you can see external and internal, um, they kind of lie right on top of each other, but their striations go in opposite directions. So again, um, the ones used for forcible expiration are the internal intercostals. Inspiration is the diaphragm and external intercostal muscles. And you can see here how when the diaphragm um, relaxes, this will be the end of expiration and the diaphragm contracts will be the end of inspiration or breathing in. Pressure changes in airflow. So the difference in pressure will help airflow into and out of the lungs. When thoracic cavity volume increases, pressure decreases. And when thoracic cavity volume decreases, pressure will increase. The air will always flow from an area of high to low pressure. So during inspiration or breathing in, the diaphragm will descend, causing your rib cage to expand. This will increase the thoracic cavity volume, um, decreasing the pressure. This atmospheric pressure then will be greater than 
the alveolar pressure and this will just cause the air to kind of be sucked into the alveoli into the lungs. Expiration then is breathing out so your diaphragm will relax and the rib cage will recoil back to its normal size. The thoracic cavity volume decreases, the pressure increases and the alveolar pressure will be greater than the atmospheric pressure so air will passively move out of the lungs. So this just looks at inspiration and expiration pressure changes. So at the end of expiration, alveolar pressure is equal to atmospheric pressure and there's no air movement. During inspiration, increased thoracic volume results in increased alveolar volume and decreased alveolar pressure. So atmospheric pressure is greater than alveolar pressure and air will move into the lungs. And during expiration, decreased thoracic volume results in decreased alveolar volume and increased alveolar pressure. So alveolar pressure is greater than atmospheric pressure and air moves out of the lungs. At the end of inspiration, I got these two mixed up, sorry about that. Alveolar pressure is equal to atmospheric pressure and there's no air movement. So simply put, this difference in pressure causes air to be sucked into the lungs during breathing in and the air to be kind of forced out of the lungs during exhaling. A lung recoil is the tendency for an expanded lung to decrease in size. It occurs during quiet expiration and it's due to elastic fibers and a thin film of fluid lining the alveoli. A surfactant is a mixture of lipoproteins and it's produced by the secretory type two cells of the alveoli um, it, surfractant basically reduces surface tension and keeps these little alveoli air sacs from collapsing. So that surfactant is extremely important um, from keeping the lungs from collapsing. Pleural pressure is pressure in your pleural cavity. It will be less than alveolar pressure and it al also helps to keep the alveoli from collapsing. If your alveoli collapse, then you have decreased airflow and decreased oxygen levels. Um, premature, so premature infants who are born uh, too soon, their lungs aren't fully developed in that their lungs cannot produce sufficient surfactant. Um, so many babies who are born prematurely will need to be given some sort of synthetic surfactant to keep their lungs from collapsing. Uh, factors that influence pulmonary ventilation is your lung elasticity. This is the ability of your lungs to recoil between ventilations, and this will be decreased um, by emphysema. Lung compliance is the expansion of your thoracic cavity, and this is affected if the rib cage is damaged. And respiratory passageway resistance occurs during an asthma attack, an infection, or a tumor. Pulmonary volume, so we have a way of kind of measuring pulmonary volumes and ventilation rates in a clinical setting to see how well the lungs are functioning. And a spirometer is a device that measures um, pulmonary volumes. Tidal volume is the volume of air inspired and expired during quiet breathing. So this is just breathing normally. The inspiratory reserve volume is the volume of air that can be inspired forcefully after a normal inspiration. The expiratory reserve volume is the volume of air that can be expired forcefully after a normal expiration. And the residual volume is the volume of air remaining in the lungs after a maximal expiration. Um, this cannot be measured with a spirometer. Um, this is just the volume of air remaining in the lungs all the time um, after any sort of exhale. Vital capacity is the maximum amount of air a person can expire after a maximum inspiration. And we get that by adding these three values together as described on the previous slides. And total lung capacity just takes the vital capacity plus the residual volume. And this graph really puts it into a little more perspective and maybe you can understand these values a little bit better. So this is just normal breathing tidal volume. Your inspiratory reserve volume um, is with a max, the volume associated with the maximum inspiration. And the expiratory reserve volume is the volume of air associated with the maximum expiration. The residual volume is the volume of air that remains in the lungs at all times. And this is how we can calculate vital capacity and then total lung capacity by adding up the previous associated or appropriate measurements for that. Factors that influence 
uh, your pulmonary volumes are your gender, your age, your height, and your weight. Height is a big one because people who are taller will just have naturally larger thoracic cavities and probably larger lungs. The respiratory membrane. So we'll talk a little bit more about gas exchange here. This is where gas exchange occurs between the blood and the air. It will be primarily, primarily in the alveoli, um, a little bit in the respiratory bronchioles and alveolar ducts, but primarily in the alveoli. Um, the gas exchange does not occur in bronchioles, bronchi, and trachea. They will just carry the air eventually to the alveoli. Um, gas exchange is influenced by the thickness of the membrane, total area of the membrane, and partial pressure of the gases. Uh, the membrane thickness will be increased. Um, an increased thickness will decrease the rate of diffusion. Pulmonary edema or swelling of the lungs will decrease diffusion. The rate of gas exchange will then also be decreased. Um, oxygen exchange will be affected before carbon dioxide because carbon dioxide can always diffuse a little bit more easily than oxygen. The total membrane surface area of the alveoli is about 70 square meters, so the size of a basketball court. I said a tennis court, but I guess it could be a little bit bigger than that. Um, the respiratory membrane surface area can be decreased due to removal of lung tissue, destruction from cancer, or emphysema. The partial pressure is the pressure ex exerted by a specific gas in a mixture of gases, and the total atmospheric pressure of all gases at sea level is um, one atmosphere or 760 millimeters of mercury. Uh, the atmosphere is about 21% oxygen and the partial pressure for oxygen is 160 millimeters of mercury. So the upper case letter P represents the partial pressure of a certain gas and we label it PO2. Cells in the body will use oxygen and produce carbon dioxide as a waste product so blood returning from tissues and entering your lungs will always have a decreased partial pressure of oxygen and an increased partial pressure of carbon dioxide. So oxygen will diffuse from the alveoli, the air, into the pulmonary capillaries, your blood, and carbon dioxide will always diffuse from your capillaries into the alveoli air. So this just is a great kind of summary of gas exchange and showing the partial pressures of oxygen um, and carbon dioxide. So um, as you breathe in air, oxygen will move into the arteries, going to your lungs or your heart, and then out to the tissues where oxygen will be offloaded. Then carbon dioxide will be put into the blood supply, your veins, brought back to your lungs where carbon dioxide will be exhaled through the air you breathe out. Blood will flow from the lungs through the left side of the heart to all your tissue capillaries. Oxygen diffuses from your capillaries into the interstitial fluid because the pressure of oxygen in the interstitial fluid is lower than the capillary. So oxygen will diffuse passively from the inter... Oxygen diffuses um, from the interstitial fluid into cells because it's a less pressure. Here takes a look at the gas exchange in tissues, talking about how carbon dioxide is transported in the blood. Um, in tissues, CO2 diffuses into the plasma and into your red blood cells. And in red blood cells, carbon dioxide will react with water to form carbonic acid. Um, carbonic acid it eventually dissociates into to form a bicarbonate ion, which is HCO3 plus a hydrogen ion. And in what we call the chloride shift, an antiporter allows this bicarbonate ion to diffuse out of the red blood cells and chloride ions to diffuse in, which maintains their electrical neutrality. Oxygen will be released from hemoglobin and oxygen diffuses out of red blood cells and plasma into the tissue. Hydrogen ions will combine with hemoglobin, which will promote the release of oxygen from hemoglobin, and we call that the Bohr effect. Carbon dioxide will also combine with hemoglobin um, and hemoglobin that has released oxygen will readily combine uh, with carbon dioxide. More gas exchange in the lungs. Um, again, I think this kind of shows you then the opposite effect. So um, in the lungs, carbon dioxide will diffuse from your red blood cells and the plasma into your alveoli in the lungs. Um, carbonic anhydrase will catalyze the formation of CO2. 
um, carb bicarbonate ions and hydrogen will combine to replace um, the HCO3. And we have another chloride shift in antiporter where oxygen will diffuse into the plasma and into the red blood cells. Some of the oxygen will remain in your plasma. Oxygen will bind to hemoglobin and we have the same two types of effects. So CO2 will always diffuse from cells as a waste product back into the bloodstream in the capillaries. CO2 enters the blood and will be transported in your plasma combined with blood proteins and bicarbonate ions. And this goes to show how CO2 is normally transported in the blood. It first reacts with water to form carbonic acid and bicarbonate ions will dissociate into a hydrogen ion and a bicarbonate ion. Carbonic anhydrase will increase the rate of CO2 reacting with water. And it's important to remember here that CO2 levels always increase blood pH levels. And I want you guys to remember that because there are a lot of acid-base imbalances in the blood and they usually have to do with CO2 levels because CO2 levels will directly affect the pH level of the blood. So CO2 levels increase blood. If when, C, when CO2 levels increase, the blood pH levels decreases. A normal respiratory rate is 12 to 20 respirations per minute in adults. And in children, the rates are higher and could vary between 20 to 40. Uh, the, rhythm, the rhythm of your breathing is controlled by neurons in the medulla oblongata, and the rate is determined by the number of times your respiratory muscles are stimulated. So this just shows the respiratory structures in the brainstem in the medulla oblongata, and then how they will control the respiratory muscles. Um, this is an involuntary process, so you breathe without knowing. So when you're sleeping, you're, you continue to breathe. There is a voluntary process associated with it if you forcefully exhale or inhale, uh, but there, the involuntary process is controlled in the medulla oblongata. You have a higher brain center that allows voluntary breathing. Um, emotions and speech affect breathing. The herring brewer reflex will inhibit the respiratory center when lungs are stretched during inspiration. So this just looks at the nervous and chemical mechanisms of breathing, um, showing kind of an inhibitory or a stimulatory response with the green and red arrows um, and how different things can either increase or decrease breathing. So pain can increase breathing, skeletal muscle can increase breathing, um, lungs, a lot of things will increase breathing, some will inhibit them. Chemical control of breathing. So you have chemoreceptors in the medulla oblongata, which will respond to changes in blood pH. And like I mentioned a little bit before, blood pH are produced by changes in blood CO2 levels. And an increase in carbon dioxide in the blood causes a decreased or acidic pH, which will result in increased breathing to try to rid the body of excess CO2. Low blood levels of oxygen stimulate chemoreceptors in the carotid and aortic bodies, which will also increase breathing. So here's just a look at regulation of blood pH. If anything gets high or low, um, but low or higher or lower than normal in the normal range of blood pH. So for example, if homeostasis is disturbed, if blood pH increases, you'll have receptors and control centers that will decrease breathing. Um, so it'll try to retain or increase blood CO2, and that will decrease the blood pH back to normal. If you have a homeostasis disturbance where blood pH decreases, you'll have an increase in breathing to try to decrease blood CO2 levels to try to get blood pH back to normal. And that's the end of this slideshow. Thanks for listening to this chapter, guys, and we'll see you for the next lecture.